joining us, you guys. Um, so this is actually a fairly short presentation, and I hope that we have kind of time um, for questions or if you guys can kind of direct me to go into a certain area um, as you want. Um, outreach engagement is a really big topic. It's like saying let's do a webinar on science, so I'm hoping to kind of leave some time at the end for you guys to direct what you want to hear more about. Um, so my name is Katie Jacobson, and I work for the Oregon Sea Grant Program, which is a part of Oregon State University. Um, and Sea Grant, in general, if you haven't worked with it before, is actually sort of a part of NOAA as well. So uh, each state that has an ocean or a Great Lake in it typically will have a Sea Grant Program, and that receives some funding from NOAA, and then they have to have kind of matching funding from an academic institution in their state. So here in Oregon, we're partnered with Oregon State University. Each program is a little different in sort of what it does, but generally speaking, Sea Grant programs are there not only to fund research, coastal and marine research, but also to do outreach and engagement with various stakeholder groups. So I've been in this position for about 12 years, um, and I actually grew up here in Newport in a commercial fishing family. Um, and so I work directly with the commercial fishing industry as well as coastal communities and other stakeholders sort of at large. Um, and I do marine education and outreach. And then um, that's kind of the fun part of my job, although I like all of it. But then the other thing I do is really build process and work with the university and the state on how they engage the public in somewhat controversial research projects um, or policy things. So I'm. Um, I always like to be involved from the very beginning, and we'll talk about why, but sometimes I'm actually brought in in the middle when things aren't going so well. So things I just wanted to um, cover today, uh, kind of some definitions around outreach and engagement. Um, there's a lot of things that are used interchangeably, um, which isn't correct use of those words. Um, some assumptions that people kind of carry around when it comes to science communication and outreach, why engagement is important, and sort of talking about the siting for the Northwest um, National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which is OSU's um, grid-connected wave energy testing center that we just got money to build. And then we'll have time um, for questions. So definitions. There's a lot of um, terms that are used by people, and typically they're used kind of interchangeably, but for those of us that do outreach and engagement, they're not interchangeable. They actually mean different things. Um, and so the first one is outreach, and that's probably used most often. So anytime people are talking about communicating with the public or getting the word out, um, or they want the public to know something, they will usually use the term outreach. And outreach is really one-way communication. So um, a basic example of that is when you get an email in your inbox and you think, oh, my friend Sarah would like that. And so you like forward it to Sarah, and you go, here you go, Sarah, I thought, I thought you'd like this. You just did outreach. So it's basically just getting information out, and it is one-way communication. So it's just delivering information. Um, outreach, at least for those of us that do outreach and engagement work, is typically um, not sort of the holy grail of engagement and outreach or work. So it's just basically the tip of the iceberg of sort of what's possible. Um, most good kind of projects with stakeholders have components of both outreach and engagement, but they are different. So then getting to engagement, engagement um, in a simple definition is two-way communication. So you take that outreach, you're giving the information to somebody, but then you're having a conversation about it back. So take the email example, send it to your friend Sarah and say, hey, tell me what you think about this article. That's engagement. You just ask for information back. So that's a basic term. When it comes to research projects, um, really engaged research is what we aim for in collaborative research, which is in when the actual project itself is designed through engagement. So sort of a more typical research project is when you have a, a scientist or a scientist team or a lab sort of deciding a research question. And then if they decided to do outreach, they would tell their audience about that and maybe get some feedback on it if they were doing engagement. But the way that science um, is really starting to swing now is towards engaged research which is you'd actually start with engagement and go into a community and say, hey, what kinds of um, science questions do you have? What are you interested in? And you would use engagement to actually um, come up with the research question and then continue to engage your audience through the research process, oftentimes actually using your audience to do some of the outreach for you. 
And so in that model, that's engaged research. And then getting into what a stakeholder is, and this is another term that's sort of used, um, kind of overused a little bit. So um, stakeholder is a specific group of people that has an interest in your work or in your research. And that specific interest can be positive or negative or maybe unknown. Um, the stakeholder is sort of not the same as just saying the public. In fact, generally speaking, those of us that do outreach and engagement work sort of hate the term general public because it's not defining an actual audience. Um, and in good outreach and engagement work, you always want to define who your audience is so that you can um, deliver information that best meets their needs and learning styles. So a stakeholder is someone that has a vested interest in your work. Oftentimes in projects, you'll have more than one stakeholder groups, and then you have multiple audiences. Free choice learning. Um, free choice learning is a newer, newish kind of term, and it's um, basically when people, this mostly applies to adults, but not always, basically. When you're out of the formal education setting, and formal education being K-12 and a college setting, um, and you start to um, kind of make your own decisions about learning. So anything you do to basically learn information that's not part of formal education is free choice learning. And so sometimes you have stakeholders that engage in a process or in research as part of their free choice learning. So they're deciding that they would like to learn about this and that's why sort of they're engaging. Um, and then finally, community. There's a lot of different ways to define communities and a lot of different research projects around what a community is. If you look it up in peer-reviewed um, literature, there's all kinds of stuff. But the way that um, I typically define it and others that do outreach and engagement work is in two ways. There's a community of place, which is a geographic location, so like Newport or Rhode Island or Toledo, Ohio, or whatever. It's a community of place, so a geographic place. And then there's a community of interest. So you have like the fishing community is the community of interest. The environmental community is a community of interest. And oftentimes in working on a project, you will have both. So you will have a community of place you are working with and then a community of interest, which is oftentimes beyond one community of place. So like when I work with the fishing community, um, they might live in Newport or live in Astoria, but they're fishing um, the whole coastline. And so they are a community of um, interest that crosses over multiple communities of place. And sort of why that's important is as you're designing outreach and engagement tools, you want to make sure that you're reaching your audience correctly. And so we have had people um, come in and try to do projects. They were trying to reach fishermen and they thought they were doing that by reaching them in the community that the project was taking place. So with, um, this is a real example from Renew Renewable Energy. We had a private developer um, looking at an offshore wind project in Coos Bay, Oregon, and they reached out to the fishing community in that community in Coos Bay and thought they had the right audience, and they didn't, because a lot of the um, larger vessels that fish off of Coos Bay are actually in Newport or Astoria, not from Coos Bay. And so that's why it's important to define that community of interest and the community of place so that you're not sort of missing your audience. Some assumptions about outreach and engagement. Um, and there's a lot of these. These are just sort of my favorite ones and ones that people, pe people typically sort of carry with them. The first one, um, which we hear a lot, is sort of like we need to get the word out. So someone's doing a science project or someone's looking at citing, um, you know, wave energy device or something, and, you know, you just, we, need, we need to let people know. We need to get the word out. Um, and what's sort of wrong with this assumption is it typically does not produce the intended results because you're not um, defining your audience. And additionally, there's been a lot of research done on, on outreach, on getting the word out, and getting the word out doesn't necessarily move the needle on behavior change or on having the effect that you want. And so while there's been lots of science communication over the years, um, public support for research um, has not really significantly changed despite getting the word out. Um, and so this is one of those examples where people need to think critically about what the actual goal is 
And so simply getting the word out probably isn't going to lead to engagement. It probably isn't going to lead to behavior change or for people having a more positive view of your project as maybe it's going to be perceived negatively. Um, another assumption is um, that people know how to communicate. So I hear this from scientists a lot, that we don't need help with outreach and engagement or with science communication because we know how to communicate this message. We're experts in this, um, so we don't need help. And um, again, back to the research on science communication is that while they may be very good at communicating that information to the audience they are used to, so communicating to other scientists about this information, um, typically speaking, um, they're not very good at communicating that with the audience they're trying to target for outreach and engagement. And this assumption also um, kind of plays off of, of people thinking that the audience is an empty vessel so that they don't know anything and that simply by applying the information you're going to fill them up with knowledge. And what's not true about that is people typically already have knowledge and assumptions um, and life experiences that makes them not an empty vessel. So trying to communicate with them, you have to actually be clear about what your audience already knows and already perceives about the potential topic. Um, and so sometimes scientists are not the best people to be doing that communication work. Sometimes it's people that actually specialize in behavior change and communication that can do a better job. Um, this is a common one as well, which is um, if my audience only had information Z, then their behavior would change. If they just knew what I knew, they would do something different. Behavior change is a um, complete topic of research all on its own. Um, we could do a whole webinar just on that. And um, behavior change takes a lot. So it, it is very challenging to achieve behavior change. And what we know about it is it typically does not result from one thing. So if you want people to come to a workshop, for example, because you think if they get this information and they're going to change their behavior, most of them probably would not change their behavior from a workshop. Some of them might, but it wouldn't necessarily be as a result of just your workshop. Um, what leads to behavior change is a multitude of things that people collect over their lives. And so there typically is a tipping point, and it might be that workshop, but you can't necessarily take credit for just your workshop being the thing that got behavior change. Because if you ask people, um, and there's been some science around like diabetes education and that kind of stuff, um, and they might say, well, you know, yeah, I came to this workshop, but my mom had diabetes, and I have prediabetes, and I read this article, and then I came to the workshop, and then I decided to change my behavior. So, like I said, it's a culmination of many things that typically get it, not just having, quote, the right information or this information. Um, another one is that the public will consider the information thoughtfully, and therefore will kind of learn what you'd like them to learn. Um, sort of the public may or may not consider it thoughtfully or consider your information at all. Um, and then even if they do consider it thoughtfully, learning may not result. Um, and I know you on the phone are educators, and so you probably know this already, um, but learning has many different factors that go into it. So it's not simply about getting information um, that results in learning. Um, there's values that filter information. There's competing sources of information that people have to um, sort through. And there's a processing that people have to do with information. So it may or may not result in actual learning. And the last one is that successful communication um, and outreach is an art. Um, and it is, but it isn't only an art. And I think for those of us um, that do it, it's very dismissive of the fact that there's a lot of research on how to do outreach and engagement. There is best practices. There is an academic component to it. And so while um, when you're in the act of actually doing outreach and engagement, it is an art. You do have to be able to create something. And there is a creative process for me when I do it. But it is also a science. sort of why engagement matters or what are some of the motivations behind um, engagement. And many things, especially when we talk about like marine renewable energy and the siting processes for that, it's often required um, through the NEPA process, which is the um, Environmental Protection Act. Um, it's a required piece. And going through um, 
uh, like, you know, Division of State Lands to get your permits, often a, a public notice or um, a time for people can take written comments or even a public hearing is also required. Typically, those required pieces, though, really miss the boat when it comes to engagement. And so while there might be opportunity for the public to sort of weigh in and send in their comments or go and make their three-minute comment um, at a public meeting, typically those are after the process has kind of gone, gone along a little ways. And so the real opportunity for engaging with stakeholders and actually um, reducing critical errors um, and possible failures in the process usually have already been um, you're already usually past the point of being able to do certain things when you just get to that required pieces. So typically those required pieces and the types of um, topics that are happening right now are not enough. You have to go beyond just what's required if you really want to have results and have sort of a successful um, results in your project with the public. There's also sort of ethical practice and personal motivation. So when it comes to doing more than what's required, um, a lot of times why it's done has to do with the researchers or people are involved in sort of their own um, personal ethics or the ethics of their university or group that they're with. And um, personal motivation, you know, they have a value around um, engaging the public. Um, and additionally, um, funding requirements these days are really starting to change. So it used to be that funders like the National Science Foundation, um, if you had really good science, and that could go through scrutiny and rank really highly in the um, competitive process that, you know, you were high up to get funding. Um, now those grant requirements are requiring outreach and engagement plans, a broader impact, societal relevance. And not only do you have to have those in your grants, but they are beginning to scrutinize those maybe as harshly as they scrutinize your science. And so we're seeing a lot of researchers um, that traditionally were able to get funded, they're very good science, now having um, issues getting funded because they don't have a very robust outreach and engagement um, piece in their proposals. And so there's been a lot of people that um, have come to Oregon Sea Grant in the last maybe five years, um, sort of with frustration that they're not able to get funding in the way they used to be able to. Um, and there's been some really nice stories of people kind of making it over that edge of, um, you know, being frustrated and mad that they sort of have to do this outrage. So then um, doing it and really understanding its value and how it sort of puts them um, better uh, knowledgeable about what the community needs are and uh, better able to design research that is meeting questions of stakeholders. And additionally, sort of another motivation or why it matters is, um, land grant uh, universities. So if you're not familiar with the land grant um, system, many universities are land grants, but not all of them. Um, Oregon State, who I work for, is. And these are um, basically universities that um, have an obligation to be doing research and getting that word and engagement back to the public. Um, and so back when the Morrell Act was funded during the Civil War, the whole idea was that colleges at this point were mostly agriculture, all had an agricultural research component. Um, the idea was uh, from a land-grant university was to actually grant them land, actual land, that they would do this ag research on, and this land would both be near the university and away from the university in communities, and that what was learned from doing that agricultural research on the land would then be extended to the public and to farmers and ranchers to better increase um, harvests. And that work would be done through extension agents, sort of that back and forth. So that was the original concept of land-grant universities. And if you work for a land-grant university, whether you're an extension person or not, um, there is still sort of a um, constraint on you to be doing work and getting it back to the community. And some, of course, do a better job than, than others do. Um, and I think the biggest one, the biggest sort of lesson here in all of this is that, especially when you're working on um, projects that um, are long-term, that required going through a siting process or that require going through a permitting process, it is almost always the human dimension and the societal piece that will fail projects um, more so than the engineering or environmental piece. And if any of you have heard of the Cape Wind Project um, on the East Coast, it's a very good example of a project that had fairly solid engineering and they were working through the environmental process. 
but it's sort of failure to recognize and engage the public and relevant stakeholders in the beginning that ended up tying up and failing that project. Um, and so success or failure of a project from it sort of moving forward, um, a lot of times hinges on outreach and engagement. And that's not something that people always recognize. Um, and sometimes when they recognize that, it's too late, which is really unfortunate. So part of what I do with Sea Grant is really work with scientists and um, researchers, engineers, to try to get them to think about outreach and engagement early on in their careers and early on in their projects so that they can build those pieces into what they're doing so that hopefully we can avoid a Cape Wind type situation. So just to kind of give you an example of um, some of the work I've done and specifically um, around renewable energy because I know that's one of the sort of focus areas you guys are learning about this year. Um, so on the left there is sort of a cartoon of the Pacific Marine Energy Center which will be the grid-connected uh, wave energy testing center that OSU is putting off of Newport, Oregon. And so the idea of this is there'd be um, several different devices being tested at the same time. So this is not like a commercial scale um, wave energy park where you would have sort of the same devices, but a place where researchers um, and developers could come um, throughout the world and test their device. So you, in theory, would have many different kinds of devices in the water at the same time, and then that energy would be coming back um, to shore through a, a buried cable. This had been a dream um, through from OSU for many, many years to have this grid-connected wave energy testing center. Um, it actually started with a particular researcher, Annette Bon Juan, who originally was testing her own ideas for wave energy converters. Um, and early on in that process, she was connected with Oregon Sea Grant and myself. This was maybe 12 years ago, right when I first started, um, because people had recognized that um, the work that she was doing had possible implications to the fishing industry um, with where they um, did commercial dungeness crabbing, which is the most profitable fishery um, that we have in, on the West Coast. So I was brought into that process really early. And at the time, she was just testing her own um, devices. Um, and so we started working with the fishing industry to think about where in the ocean she could test those devices. And these were fairly small, like the size of the table um, that she would put in for a day or two. So that was a fairly easy process to think about. Where in the ocean could we put in a device during the summer for a day or two that would be out of the way? And then um, back in about 2000 and we had several um, commercial um, permits filed for Oregon for um, wave energy development, not from OSU, but from companies from around the world. So that really put the state into a crisis point. Um, we had several different permits filed uh, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and we had communities that did not know what wave energy was, that did not know who FERC was, and that did not know what a preliminary permit was. Furthermore, these preliminary permits already um, penciled out a specific space in the ocean that they wanted to be. And so unfortunately, that opportunity to work with the public early to say where would we put these things was already missed. And so it was very volatile because we have permits already being filed for over space that's already used for something else. And a lot of these small communities really do depend on fishing for economic dollars. And with wave energy being sort of a new technology, there's a lot of questions from those communities about is replacing um, this known economic producer with an unknowing one something we want to do. So in the meantime, with that process going on, um, OSU was still interested in um, creating a test center for, uh, for wave energy devices. It became evident to us at Oregon Sea Grant um, that the fishing community and other stakeholders needed a better way to engage um, in this process. Our fishing community in Oregon is really not very socially organized. Um, and so we started working with different communities of place, um, like Coos Bay and Newport and uh, Garibaldi, to create fishing advisory groups um, that would have various sectors of the fishing industry. So. Um, crabbers, shrimpers, groundfish fishermen, what we call distant water fishermen who 
live here but have vessels that fish in Alaska, um, recreational fishermen, charter boat fishermen, all in sort of one group. So that as we talked about different projects and have developers talk about different projects, we wouldn't run into the situation where the crabber said, no, it's fine, and the shrimp fisherman said, no, it's not. We wanted everybody to be in the same room together. So we started creating these groups. Um, the one in Newport that I worked primarily with was called Fine, or the Fishermen Involved in Natural Energy. And one of the first um, kind of relationships we built um, with them was with OSU. Um, and actually, they were a group that signed a letter of support to create NIMRIC, which was the Northwest National Marine Renewable Energy Center, which is OSU's um, and uh, University of Washington and University of Alaska Fairbanks um, Ocean and Tidal Energy Testing Centers. Uh, the fishing community actually signed a letter of support to um, create that. And that's not typical. Um, that's not something you hear a lot, but um, why it worked is because the fishing industry had been engaged early in these processes, or as early as possible, and they understood the value of testing and research. They wanted testing and research done um, before we had commercial projects in the water. So fast forward a little bit, um, NIMRIC got funded, and as they started uh, looking at creating a um, grid-connected test center, um, the question that NIMRIC had and Belinda Batten, who was the director, was where? Where do we put this? Um, so we had two processes that essentially happened at, sim at the same time and that um, interacted with each other. One was sort of an engineering-based process done by consultants to sort of look at where in Oregon's waters, um, and I shouldn't say Oregon's waters, we're actually looking outside of the territorial sea, which is zero to three miles, so not technically Oregon's legal waters, but off of Oregon. Um, where off of Oregon uh, has sort of the right um, technical requirements for this kinds of projects, so has the right bottom, has the right depth, um, has a way to get a cable back to shore, um, those types of things, has the right wave climate. Um, and then at the same time, um, I started working on a process to engage the public in helping us select where we are going to put this site. So with some basic engineering stuff done, real briefly, we sort of narrowed it down to um, four possible kind of communities, not sites, because we were going to let the public pick, pick the site, but four possible regions. Um, one was up north, uh, Camp Rialea, which is near Astoria. One um, site was in Newport. And then two were south of Newport, one in Reedsport, and one in Coos Bay. So we knew those are our four areas that we were going to begin to look at. Um, we first then connected over the six or seven months with various community leaders, um, elected officials, city managers, port commissioners, um, leaders of environmental groups, um, fishing community members, basically everybody that was a mover and shaker in that community. Um, real estate agents, because of course we knew we needed to get property to land the cable when we came to shore. We started meeting with those community leaders. That was our step one. And essentially we did that to start figuring out exactly who our audience was in each community. Because um, it's not necessarily the same. There was definitely crossover, like fishing community, mayor crossover, but we had more tribal um, participants in some community because there's more of a tribal presence. We had um, communities where we had more recreational fishermen, so they were more involved in the communities where there's really not a lot of recreational fishing. So again, defining that audience within each community. After that, we did um, basically public meetings, so your town hall type meeting where we had presentations by Belinda about the project, we had Sarah Hinkle, who I think you guys had a webinar with previously, talking about the environmental um, component uh, of this project and sort of what they know about those sites and what they'd be learning, also to address questions about whales and that sort of thing. Um, and then we spent time at those meetings talking about the process we were going to use to select these sites. So after we did sort of that round and had some additional kind of engineering information back, um, we narrowed it down to two communities. We took Camp Rialea off the table, and we took it off the table because Camp Rialea is um, a military base, and we started to get some information that it would be very challenging to have um, a testing center run by the university inside a military base. Uh, did you have to be a U.S. 
citizen to get inside that, well, that would be a little challenging if we had developers coming from all over the world and they had to be U.S. citizens to get in, um, which wasn't entirely clear. We would get answers like, well, maybe you have to be or maybe not. So that wasn't um, something that was going to work. And then the other, pro the other area we took off the table was Coos Bay, Oregon. And mostly we took it off because there just wasn't a lot of community excitement. Uh, we had low attendance at our town hall meetings. We tried again. We had low attendance again. Talking to community leaders there, no one was very excited about it and actually even sort of said, yeah, take it up north. So we listened to that and we focused our attention on Reedsport um, and Newport, both of those communities that were uh, more generally excited about having this project. So from there, we created a community site selection team. Um, which uh, we appointed. They were made up of various stakeholders in those communities that would basically write up a proposal um, to NIMRIC, kind of saying why they think um, the project could come in their community. It wasn't just simply about the space, so not just defining the space, but also things like do they have ideas for cost matching? Where would the cable land? Who owns that property? Is there, um, you know, a space for infrastructure in your community? Um, you know, where are the water access points we could use? What other um, infrastructure or businesses you, that you have that could support this coming in? Um, a critical point of uh, those proposals were getting the actual site in the ocean. Um, in Newport, the fine committee, the fishermen involved in natural energy, who had been working with OSU and NIMRIC a very long time. They basically, um, in fact, that's the picture on the right, is a picture of the NOAA chart they wrote on at one of their meetings, um, basically citing where they wanted that project to go. Um, and those pretty much are the exact coordinates of where our project will be, or at least somewhere inside of that box. Um, so FINE was really instrumental um, in providing that site. Um, drew on that map, rolled it up, handed it to the site team and said, you know, there you go, anywhere in this box is going to be okay with us. Um, that didn't mean for them that there isn't losses to fishing grounds. Um, those grounds are fished. We are at the height of crab season right now, and if you took an airplane and flew over it, you'd see crab pots in that site, so it's not that it's not used. Um, it's that it's a site they felt they could um, sort of give to wave energy and not be hit too hard. And again, they'd had a value for um, testing and research and not commercialization. So they would rather give the space to testing than they would to commercialization, at least at this point. Um, finding space in Reedsport and working with those fishermen was a bit cha more challenging because they had not really been engaged with. Um, they didn't have a fine type group. And actually, on uh, starting to work with them, I discovered a lot of baggage in that community. Um, so there were fishermen that wouldn't meet with the mayor and other elected officials in the room because they didn't trust them. And that came back to one of those commercial projects, the project from Ocean Power Technologies, which was filed um, in Reedsport previously. Uh, the fishermen really felt like the community just really wanted that and just uh, didn't do anything to help industry deal with the fact that that project was placed in really important fishing grounds for them. And so. Um, you know, outreach and engagement oftentimes, if not done correctly, can lead to issues um, for other people coming after you to do. And that was one of the times where I sort of got caught up and had to fix something um, that I didn't create. So the um, company that had been working in that community previously that had not been a, done a very good job of engaging the community or dealing with issues created community conflict between elected officials in the fishing industry. And when I rolled up in town several years later trying to get those two parties to work together towards this proposal, I then stumble upon this problem that was created by someone else and essentially had to help um, fix that. And um, that sort of gets back to why outreach and engagement. Well, my motivation in there was really personal and ethical. I always believe in um, leaving a community better than you found it. And so while it wasn't necessarily my responsibility to fix those relationships in that community, I felt it was sort of my personal responsibility and personal ethic to do that. But eventually, we did get a site um, out of Reedsport fishing community. 
Um, and those two proposals went forward and ultimately Newport um, was selected for the um, PMAC Center. Um, and it was selected mostly because of um, some sort of external reviews that we did on those um, sites and on those proposals. And people that work for the European Marine Energy Center in Scotland really felt that um, since this is going to be a, on an international market of testing, so there's many places all over the world that you can test, um, they felt like because Newport was closer to the airport, had more um, hotels and um, businesses that are sort of recognizable on an international level, um, that that would work better for people coming internationally to test. So ultimately, that is why Newport was um, selected. The Reedsport community was actually very upset by this and um, really, really wished to have that project in their community for economic um, development. So we actually had some repair work to do with them um, afterwards to make sure that they understood um, why that happened and that they were still willing to partner with us on some other things. And we have continued to kind of include them where we can. Um, on developing the site in Newport and uh, looking out for economic development opportunities for that community. So that's just kind of how we ran the process in Newport, at least in a nutshell. Um, and all those steps I told you about siting um, for NIMRIC was about two and a half years of work. Um, so really to do this right, it takes time. Um, it's not easy and it does take time and careful planning to kind of execute this. Um, and back to one of the assumptions about sort of communication and outreaches and art, um, it can be. And uh, it does include science to make sure using good outreach and engagement methods. But in the middle of this, when we had to sort of change directions and do things a little differently, that's where sort of that art piece comes in. So with that, I really just have um, time for questions or if you guys um, want more detail on something or want to hear another project example, I'd be happy to do that. Okay, so for, excuse me, for everyone who's on the line, um, just use the chat box to type in any questions that you may have. Okay, well, I, I was thinking as you were going through this, um, sort of what, what are your thoughts on, given what's happening in the federal government right now, um, how do you think that will affect your work? Do you have to think of new ways of engagement? Um, or just, is it, yeah, is it good learning as you question. go? Yeah, good question. Um, and then I see another one, too, I'll answer afterwards. but. Yeah, I have to say, I think like a lot of um, agencies and people that rely on federal funding, we're all sort of scrambling right now thinking, what does this administration want? Um, and so I think what we're, you know, we're sort of in a wait and see model, um, you know, hoarding money and that sort of stuff. But I, I think also what, what we're thinking of is this administration does, at least in theory, seem to care about jobs. And so um, part of some of the engagement and stuff we might be looking at is how do we engage communities to help create jobs and employment opportunities. Um, so for instance, with marine renewable energy, that would be a good fit because we did in turn probably help create some jobs that'll come when this center is built. So um, we're still thinking it through. We don't have all the answers. We're not sure. Um, you know, if engagement is a priority, we know it is for the state, we know it is for the university, but I think you bring up an excellent point about is that a priority for our federal government right now? And um, I guess we'll just wait wait and see. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, uh, there was one question that came in and asked, are there any examples where there can be too much community engagement where there are parts that would confuse or disorient certain stakeholders? Yes, yes to both. Um, and so there is a phenomenon known as um, engagement burnout. And actually I'm just starting to work on a research project um, right now looking at um, what are kind of the precursors to what are the signs 
experience of engagement burnout. And we mean that from the side of the participant or the audience, not from the person doing the engagement. Um, and so I'm sort of curious. I know from doing the work um, for so long that I, ha I have signs I know from communities that are burnout signs, but I'm curious to actually sort of research what those are. But um, obviously people not showing up anymore can be engagement burnout. It can also mean they just don't care or aren't um, kind of into the topic. But sometimes it can mean they're burned out. Um, the amount of things they're engaged in, so specifically when you're looking at a small community or a small community of interest, like the fishing community typically, um, is really susceptible to engagement burnout because there's so many issues going on in fisheries and often they participate in multiple fisheries. So they have to deal with um, catch shares coming in and crab pot limits coming in and um, you know new business taxes and uh, new safety regulations. And so um, they're very susceptible to burnout because the amount of issues they are engaging in can be quite high at any one time. Um, I think burnout also happens or maybe is an excuse when the topic you're trying to engage your audience in is they don't really care about um, or aren't really that into. And so it's like, and eh, burned out. You know, like, ah, eh, that's just not a priority. Um, and then sort of, um, you know, are there parts that would confuse or disorient it? Yes. Um, and I've been involved in projects where that had happened with audiences um, where, uh, and um, not, not trying to pick on scientists, but um, where sort of the science community themselves are trying to engage. And this was around, this particular example was around um, climate change adaptation. And unfortunately, um, they didn't have an educator on their team. They sort of thought they could do it themselves. And so the audience became sort of fear, fearful of the information um, and disoriented around it and um, kind of then got off in the weeds. And um, the scientists kind of lost control of the group and they got away from what the research project was actually about, which was more so um, about having conversations in the community about possible adaptations. Um, and instead, kind of the audience got so afraid of sort of the information that they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, so I have seen that happen, and I think a lot of good process design in the beginning can help with some of that. Um, the confusing part, again, a lot of times comes down to um, people that know how to communicate with certain audiences doing that communication. Um, so like when I started, my work, um, I knew nothing about wave energy, absolutely nothing. Um, but I was an expert in communicating with coastal communities in the fishing industry, so I have learned wave energy um, so that I can communicate that. Because a lot of times that goes better than a content expert in wave energy trying to communicate that information. Um, so as I go through my career, I pick up, like right now I'm picking up occupational safety and health. I'm, didn't know anything about that, but as I'm working with a researcher that's doing a project on non-fatal injuries to crab fishermen, I'm picking up the language and how you do research in occupational health. Um, so I think that confusion piece can be mitigated a lot of times if you have people that are experienced educators um, in a particular stakeholder group doing the communicating. Were there any lessons learned or best practices that came um, came in from your, I mean, obviously the most of the um, marine, re marine renewable energy so far has been, um, that's commercialized has been in Europe. So were there any best practices to follow from them? Um, well, you know, Europe doesn't necessarily engage with their communities in the same way. I would say they're more maybe outreach oriented. Um, as far as best practices from NINRIC, we did have it externally evaluated, so we had the process evaluated. Um, people there generally, maybe except for some people in Reedsport that were pretty upset the project didn't uh, go there, were generally pretty happy with the process and felt that they would engage in it again. Um, and really what the best practice that came out of that was relationship and having myself and Belinda sort of be the key people that stayed through the entire project with them. And so they really felt like they had access to information and access to me. Um, 
and sort of access to what they needed throughout the process. So that definitely came out as a best practice. Um, I felt in the practice that I wasn't accessible because um, I was running around trying to coordinate for communities. So I'm glad they felt I was accessible. I don't know if I would say I, if I felt that way, but um, I think next time I would probably put two educators on it. Uh, you know, myself and someone else, and almost break up the community so that um, there's kind of be more to go around. Um, and then the other sort of best best practices is uh, early and often, and you'll hear that a lot. So engaging communities early in the process and engaging them often, and that goes beyond just wave energy stuff as well. Okay, um, let's see. Um, let's see. Sure. Right. Next question is, I worked at the New England Aquarium as a visitor educator last summer. I noticed that we tried to educate visitors on the ecological climate-based issues surrounding our exhibits. However, it became clear that most of the people interested in the issues we were teaching were already self-educated and, and that we weren't reaching the people who really needed convincing. Is there any best way to reach people who aren't already self-engaged? Yeah, so this this is, a tr this is a tricky one, and this gets back to kind of that free choice um, learning that I talked about earlier. So free choice learning is um, sort of, you know, when you're not in a formal education, and or when you're not in formal education, excuse me, like an aquarium is an excellent, excellent example. You have a choice to go, and then you have a choice of which science to read. So people that were engaging with you on climate change were people that were sort of choosing to do that. So they already had a reason, they were already interested, et cetera. Um, so typically um, the trick when, when people aren't kind of receiving your message or aren't quote, you know, being convinced is to actually work with that audience group direct, directly and start asking them. So it'd be interesting to actually like do a survey with people that walked by your exhibits and ask them why they didn't engage in it. Um, so sometimes it's because maybe the title was off-putting, and I think also you're making an assumption that the people that walked by maybe were ones that um, weren't already convinced. Maybe they were, and they felt like they didn't need more information. Um, so I think the best way to reach the people who aren't already engaged is to start working with that group and finding out the questions. You might find out, too, that you have to um, change tracks a little bit so they're not interested in climate change. Are they interested in information about severe weather? Um, are they interested in information about um, sea level rise? Um, and this is a trick I play with some of my audiences when I know that maybe there's a topic that's going to be a red button and means disengaged, I find a way around it. So um, I have fishermen that, you know, there's no climate change. Um, not all of them are like that, but I have some. So it's like, do you want to talk about weatherizing your vessel for severe weather? Yes, I do. Okay, great. I just found an in. Um, so I would think about sort of the you know, that audience and trying to engage them and understanding them more, and then what, what, what can you drag them in? Maybe they don't want a climate change lecture, but maybe there's a piece of climate change that you can draw them in with. I hope that helps. Actually, that's um, a lot of the advice I've seen around with the new administration. <laughs> if you have family members who are having difficulty talking to them about climate change, try to find that one topic that maybe they are interested in. So I could see that that would work. Yeah, yeah, good okay. advice back, <laughs> thanks, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll ask one question. Um, so our students that come to the finals competition have to do what we call our science expert briefing. It's a, a mock briefing to Congress um, where they're looking at a piece of legislation and they're, they're trying to explain what they think the scientific requirements are related to that piece of policy. Hmm. Um, the one thing that the students come back to us and tell us they find difficult every year is they, they play the roles of different stakeholders and they come up with their individual recommendations, but then they also have to come up with a group recommendation. And they say their biggest issue is how to come to a consensus about those few group recommendations. Um, do you have any insight or thoughts or advice on how you get these groups, your communities, to come to consensus over something? 
Yeah, yeah, that's, I'm glad you guys do that. That's neat. Um, so yeah, consensus takes a lot of time. <laughs> and so that's probably why you're not getting it. And the exercise you're doing is because they're working with each other over months and not years. Um, so that's probably one reason they can't come there is because they're not working on it over time. Um, consensus is really challenging. And um, yeah, it takes a lot of time and a lot of relationship. Um, I think what the, what makes it work is people having relationships across aisles with each other. When they're all dug in, um, you're not going to get anywhere. So a lot of times I will design process simply for people to have relationship with each other. So working on um, whale entanglement issues with crab and sable fish gear right now, and um, you know I'm designing a year long process. Um, of getting to some research needs that we could probably do in a workshop in like a day. But it's not about the research, it's about the environmental community um, and the fishing community coming together on this one and both being invested in the outcome of what the research is. And I need them to have a relationship and trust with each other in order for that to happen. Otherwise, the fishermen could research something in the science, in the um, environmental community could say that's not good enough. You know, we're still gonna sue. Um, and so it takes time. And so in your exercise, you may not, you know, ha have that luxury. Um, but I guess some of the other things um, you could try instead of consensus is, um, is having them think about, you know, consensus typically involves giving up something. We don't typically think of it that way, but usually to get consensus or to have negotiation, parties do have to give up something. Um, and it's not always equal, so we have this, um, when I went through conflict resolution training, they had us really think about what our assumptions are about, um, about consensus, and most people think that consensus means you meet in the middle. So like I'm coming to the middle and you're coming to the middle and we agree. Um, and that's typically not how parties feel afterwards when they get to an agreement. Typically, they'll feel like they gave up more than half um, and so I guess maybe the framework you can put it in for students is that getting to consensus does kind of mean having to give up something and to feel bad at the end is actually fairly normal. Okay. I actually think that advice will, will probably be a big help. I think that's, um, I think you're yeah. right. They weren't, they weren't very happy if they felt that one person didn't necessarily have um, the same clout or yep. uh, same role, so. Yeah. Yeah, and it's really hard, and, and survey work, like I said, after people have um, have uh, successfully negotiated or come to a resolution, a lot of survey work afterwards show that people usually feel, on all sides, usually feel they gave up more than they should have. That's kind of like a standard thing in research on that, which I think is always interesting. Because if everybody gave up 80%, you know, <laughs> You know, almost everyone almost gave up too much. But yeah, it's very common to sort of feel like you gave up too much or that you didn't necessarily get what you want. So. Okay, well, are there any other questions from anyone online? I know we had one comment. They said, um, thank you very much that it was wonderful to hear a professional describe engagement and the timeline of the project, so. Yeah, you guys are welcome, and I am sure I'll see some of you um, when you're out here for the Science Bowl, so thanks. Yeah. Okay, well, since there's no other questions, we'll end. Um, I'll just remind everybody that uh, we did record this webinar tonight, so um, it'll be up tomorrow morning on the NOSB's uh, Professional Development Webinar Series page on our website. And it'll also be up on our YouTube channel. So you can check it out and share it with um, other educators or your teams or other students um, as much as you like. It's, it's definitely a resource we want you to use. So um, just want to thank Katie again uh, for presenting tonight. It was a different type of presentation um, than we've had in the past. But I think given the topic of marine renewable energy, it was one that was really fitting this year since there's so much involved in the topic. So thank you, Katie. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, take care. Good night, everyone. Bye.